Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sattler. Today we're talking about... The topic of rhetoric, and the big question that we have for us is, is rhetoric good or bad? And, I mean, what do you think, Dan? Is it possible to have, like, a sweeping catch-all judgment about that it's either good or it's bad what do you think uh, this is a, a tough one we have a lot <laughs> of different philosophers over the years that would have quite the opposing opinion here um but it kind of it would definitely come down to certain maybe preconceived ideas maybe what is your definition of the good or the bad here um but that's kind of another topic well and but, and what uh, you think rhetoric is too right absolutely um, and so the question is, I think the better is, can you use rhetoric for good or bad? So in this case, if you were going to use like maybe a stoic idea, um, rhetoric isn't a different, that it, it, but it is how one uses it that makes it good or bad. Yeah. yeah and, and I mean, there is definitely a possible bad use of rhetoric, right? That we, we're all familiar with people who use language to manipulate to exploit and stuff like that and you know sometimes it is rhetoric that's being used so that side is you know we know where things sit on that side and then the question is well how can you use it for good how can you persuade people to i don't know things that they need to do now aristotle will actually say somebody somebody we're going to look at in just a bit that you need rhetoric for convincing people to do the things that they ought to do you know so you need it in education um you might actually need it if you're a doctor to get their your patients to take their medications or to agree to things that they think are scary so it can have some positive uses right yeah but then you know i guess you look at uh, plato and how he talks about it and he's like oh uh you know, if you're teaching, then you're not using rhetoric, because if you're teaching, you're going towards the good of, of imparting some sort of wisdom. And if you're just giving them the facts, then it shouldn't be, why would you even need some, any order of persuasive, you know, yeah. portion to that? There, I, and I think there's something to that. If we, if we take it totally out of the realm of philosophy and we think about contemporary um, marketing and product packaging and advertising and stuff like that. So we, we know that the things that we would buy that we call generic, you know, store brand stuff. Um, it's basically the same product as the, what we think to be higher end, um, what do we call these? The, you know, the, like the good brands, right? The, the uh, name brands. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The premium stuff. And so, you know, when you look at why the premium stuff costs way more than the generic, it's in significant part because of the cost of product packaging, which is a kind of visual rhetoric, and mm. then advertising, which is oftentimes visual but very much uh, speech-based, right? Oh, you need to use this kind of ketchup or <laughs> you need to use this kind of toilet paper or, you know, pick whatever else you want or you're not going to, you're not going to have the same wonderful result with what you pay for. But, um, there's a case where whatever we want to call it, communication, rhetoric, advertising is making things in some respects worse for us. I mean, originally advertising was just like telling people stuff. It was much more informative and you'd be like, well, I have Buy some... soap A. Exactly. It is uh, 10 times more efficient than soap B. Well, so once, why wouldn't you buy soap A? Once you start doing that, it's probably puffery and rhetoric, right? Because how do you how do you quantify <laughs> ten times more efficient when it comes to soap, right? You get ten times cleaner. Um, but in, in the past, it was more like, well, this soap will get your body clean, you know, uh, made from real lye and and uh, 
whatever else they they happen to have in it. And then people start, Lander. yeah, there you go. Uh, and then people started realizing, well, you can get people to buy more and more of this if you start telling stories or in some cases just outright lying. Um, I mean, look at patent medicines, you know, back in the, the 1800s. Um, it was bad enough that they'd often contain all sorts of things that, you know, we now know are bad for your body because they're, they're essentially hard drugs, you know. Um, Cocaine. Yeah. Good old Coca-Cola. <laughs> Opium, right? <laughs> um, with a little bit of, you know, alcohol to suspend it all. Um, yeah. But they would make all sorts of wild, wild claims like this is going to uh, cure everything from lumbago to rheumatism, you know, uh, and everything in between. Well, that's 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 a, a use of rhetoric right there. So cure actual death. That's but, yes. Now that one's a hard claim to. I, I don't know if you can get people to buy that. <laughs> It'll take a corpse and get them to to move again. Well, maybe it's, this one will prevent death. That works, yeah. Because yeah. I, I mean, we're totally like outside of the philosophical topic at this point. We'll come back to it. But if you think about when you make claims like that, it's really easy to get people who aren't paying close attention or don't have that much on the ball to, to believe them because how are they going to know that it's actually false? You know, right. if you take the stuff and you don't die, then the person who's selling it to you can say, see, I told you it's going to prevent death. And if the person still dies, then you can say, well, you know, he didn't take the right amount or he was supposed to take it at nighttime and he took it in the morning. And see, this is what happens. We don't follow the instructions. This is usually referred to as counting the hits and ignoring the misses. Oh, OK. So this is like a, an actual fallacy then. Yeah, and so I guess um, I guess you can see this with uh, a prayer a lot, and so people do this with self help stuff too. They're like, "Oh, I I've bet. got this program for you. You just got to follow the program, and it's going to cost you a little money, by the way. But you follow the program and do it every single day, and you're going to lose weight, or you're going to be happy, or whatever it's going to be. You're going to have wonderful relationships, and then when you come back to them, and you're like." Hey, it didn't work out for me. They're like, well, did you did you follow the program, you know, religiously every single day? And you'd be like, well, I mean, nobody does. Uh, so, no, I didn't. Well, and then they'll be able well, to see that's the problem. You don't get your money back. <laughs> right. Um, but going back a little bit to uh, rhetoric and teaching, um, we know, especially if there's any teachers among our audience, that like some kids respond better to certain ways of presenting the information than others. That's true, yeah, yeah. And and see, so I would say that you could easily call this like a form of rhetoric of presenting the information in different ways that are, you know, amenable to the uh, you know, the audience that is there um and that only with using some sort of like changing in the ways that you present it, either visual or audio or like, you know, making yeah, yeah. it fun, putting it into a skit. You know, you can look at like uh Jesus, he's got parables that are trying to import uh, moral ideas um, yeah. but it's it's gussied up with a little story because you remember stories better than you just remember when someone tells you a thing that's true and you know um, again off on a little tangent but I think that's okay because we can bring it back to, to the key ideas so what you're talking about is what people used to refer to and still do sometimes today as learning styles right and that was like a fad in education for a while. There's kinesthetic. I'm a kinesthetic learner. I'm a visual learner. I'm an oral learner. And then we, we found out that, well, no, things aren't That's quite so. Kinda... Go ahead. It's, it's a little bunk. Like the, the didn't find out there's a lot of data to actually back up most of this stuff. Well, we found out that it's not as rigid as it was mm. being presented. It's not like this person is this kind of learner and therefore they can only access things through this modality. And that's the way it was being presented in, in educational formats. Um, you know, as it turns out, yeah, you're right. There, there are people like I learn things, uh, quite often better in chart form. And I know that my students do. So I create handouts that put, you know, like Plato's argument here into a chart form. And then there's some people who are better at, um, 
getting things from a text and there's others who get things better when it's put into the like form of a case study, right? And so, so we can do that. Um, the idea that it was that everybody should have to do things the same way, that's clearly wrong. The idea right. that everybody has like their own little niche that they fit into and they never venture out of that niche, that's clearly wrong too. It's somewhere in the middle, right? Right. Uh, Sometimes. So, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, yep. I was just going to kind of continue on here. Um, so we were like, where, where do we start here with like the, the full, we've already talked a little bit about Aristotle and Plato here. Yeah. This is where I guess we kind of like start. This is, you know, unless you're going to go back to the pre Socratics, this is kind of like where. <laughs> um, In the days of yore. <laughs> right? um, yeah. I mean, but, but rhetoric, can is... you tell us a little bit Go ahead. about some of the more uh, modern people that we'll eventually touch on here? Oh, um, actually, I have a prop, which uh, our radio listeners won't be able to hear, but we, we do this also in video form. And I've got a big, thick book here. It's one of my favorite. Kaim Perlman and uh, Olbrecht's Titeca is the New Rhetoric, a Treatise on Argumentation. This is a book that's that's big and heavy enough that you could like, crack nuts with it if you wanted to, like, you know, walnuts and pecans and stuff. But it's, it's, it's one of my favorite works, actually. And this is by a guy, well, two people who just spent a ton of time studying not just rhetoric, but also legal theory, philosophy, literature, all these different connected fields, and then put together a massive, I mean, how many pages is this? Uh, 500 plus page handbook on, um, on rhetoric and, and how argumentation works and all the different modes of it. I mean, the bibliography itself is like 30 pages long. So it's very <laughs> comprehensive. Um, that, that may be a bit of overkill. I don't think everybody needs to study rhetoric to that extent, although I kind of geek out about it. Um, and there's lots of other, you know, I, you could say that we live in a renaissance of rhetoric because in the past, it was something that you studied kind of on its own, you know, as its own field. And we've had all of these other fields that have developed in, in the 20th century and into the 21st century, like communication, studying communication just to study communication. You're going to run into rhetoric there or psychology or if you're um, – you know, studying English, you're gonna, you're sooner or later gonna run into. I mean, they actually have one division called ret comp, meaning rhetoric and composition. Um, if you're in philosophy, philosophers, for the most part, I would say, tend to be pretty hostile to rhetoric, yeah. even today. You know, there's there's exceptions, and we'll talk about those. But um, yeah, philosophers tend to to be hostile to it. Interestingly, I remember back when I was in graduate school and, and uh, I was studying philosophy and we had, um, you know, a lot of people who would date people from other uh, areas, you know, like English or history. And one of the guys who I was friends with was dating a woman who was studying law. And I was so struck by when we got together at a concert or something and she, you know, I, I got introduced to her and she was like, you know, what are you studying? I said philosophy. And she says, oh, you're one of those sophists, you know. Somehow she oh. had gotten the idea that the philosophy people were the – and if you don't – for for our listeners who don't know what a sophist <laughs> is, the sophist is essentially a person who engages in and maybe teaches rhetoric and does so – for, you know, for bad reasons, to, to manipulate people, to, you know, for greed or, you know, to, to bring about bad – bad outcomes you know they're not doing it like the doctor convincing his or her patient that they need to take their medicine right well and either bad outcomes or just like you know monetary outcomes they'll, yeah, they'll do yeah. it for money it doesn't matter you know it, it, it's what we usually can usually uh rail on the law the lawyers for and that <laughs> exactly. like oh they just take my money and then i'll i'll argue your case it doesn't matter if you did it or not i'm still gonna be you know on your side and make it so that people think better of you and so the, the what you just said here is is kind of like mind-blowing that at least the lawyers are that were of, of her particular uh schooling were uh, under the understanding that they were 
the, the philosophers they were the good guys. and not yeah. the sophists? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually, like, stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, what? Who? Wait a second, you know you're the you're the people who are always like you know making the as as they said in ancient times making the weaker argument look stronger. Right? You, you associate that uh-huh. with lawyers, and here she was saying that we philosophers do that routinely. I, I don't know what maybe she was like a weird outlier. Or Southern mm-hmm. Illinois University was different than other places, but yeah, that was that was unusual. But you know, I, and I think there's there's a even today, there's kind of a negative pejorative connotation. If you if you talk about something as being rhetoric, like I actually did a, a search on Twitter just to see what would come up if I put in quotes and rhetoric. And it's all politicians accusing each other of engaging in rhetoric, you know, because it's election season. And so saying that somebody is doing rhetoric is usually viewed as a bad thing. But you know, successful people use rhetoric all the time, including philosophers who claim that rhetoric is a bad thing and that they would never use rhetoric. They use rhetoric, too. For example, uh, Plato using the, the mouth of Socrates, even in the Gorgias, <laughs> in which he is railing against the sophist. Yeah. Um, and then he goes on to this long diatribe, which he had just moments ago uh, said was what the sophists do, like talking at length about something without actually engaging in debate. Yeah, or dialogue, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, Plato. So, let, let, I mean, let's talk about some of the, this history, right? So, you brought up yeah. Plato. Plato is somebody, if you read his dialogues, he's usually criticizing rhetoric, right? And he does have some characters who are rhetoricians. You mentioned the Gorgias. Gorgias was a great rhetoric teacher, so successful that he had a statue, a life-size statue of himself made of gold in his home city out of some of his the money that he got paid to like teach people how to speak well. So clearly he was quite successful. And the dialogue has Gorgias and Polis, one of Gorgias's like uh, protégés, I guess, hanging out in the house of this guy, Callicles, and Socrates is there, and Socrates first argues with Gorgias, then he argues with Polis, then he argues with the guy whose house it is, which is really kind of a, a rude thing to do. <laughs> and um, Socrates is is claiming, and this is you know him being a mouthpiece for Plato, as you said, that rhetoric is irresponsible. You know, he's he's asking Gorgias, "Do you make people better people by teaching them rhetoric?" And Gorgias says, "Well, I hope so." You know, and then Socrates well, he even says that he teaches wisdom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and so you know, wisdom with rhetoric would be like, well, when do you actually? say these things when is it okay to trick people um Mm -hmm. and gorgias he has to in the end say well i guess i don't do that i'm just really good at teaching people how to persuade other people you know um and so i believe believe that the argument like i guess the turning of the argument is like he makes this assertion that he's teaching wisdom which is a uh, good, yeah. And then later on says, "But don't you just say that one of your your students can use this for bad ends?" And it's like, "Well, yes, I can." It's like Socrates is like, "Well, then you can use it for bad ends. You're not teaching them wisdom." Yeah. Um, I was like, "I got you." <laughs> I mean, it's Which it's is- sort of like today we <sighs> would use the metaphor of like putting a loaded gun into somebody's hand. So so mm-hmm. rhetoric is like putting not a crappy cheap shake it and it falls apart kind of old 45 in their hand but like a really nice new gun with hollow point ammunition you know you put it into somebody's hand now they you know if they want to shoot people they can do it really really well or if they want to kill a robber or they want to i don't know kill a mountain lion that's threatening people it can be used for all sorts of things but there's nothing that guarantees putting that gun into somebody's hand that they're going to use it for good that's right. that's the big problem you know, so if you've got somebody who's already a bad person and then you arm them with rhetoric, you're creating a dangerous situation. I guess this is kind of one of the reasons why we have such a negative view of rhetoric is that we have uh, so many people in our society yeah. that are, you know, a lot of politicians usually have ends that are like, you know, either increasing their own power, or their own wealth, or both. Um, and so they'll they'll use rhetoric and they'll uh, to 
get to the ends that they want. Or you can see this yeah, also yeah. on lots of like cable news that will really pump up hate and anger and fear um, because they know that doing that gets them more money. It's more them more attention. Whereas this actually is not for the betterment of either the individual nor the society, but they're using that rhetoric in order to increase themselves financially. Yeah, and there's a lot of different techniques that have developed over the last couple decades that are they're based in um, human psychology, which hasn't fundamentally changed, and they're based in if you if you look back at it, you can identify rhetorical te- techniques being used. Um, but they're new to us. So, for example, once we started having the 24-hour news cycle, a lot of the news became not really news, but rather there is a developing story. We're going to have more details for you later. Here's a little bit of speculation about what it might might be going on. We'll get some news to you in about an hour from now. And it appeals to um, something that we've identified in recent years called FOMO, fear of missing out, right? So you, you, you keep your uh, radio on or you keep your TV on or something like that. And it's just the same stuff. Like the next hour comes by and they're like, well, we don't quite know what's going on. We know that there's a developing story here. You know, and if you, if you tried to pull that sort of stuff back in, say, 1970, people would be like, well, get back to me when you actually have a story, man. <laughs> you know, turn it off. But, but you got you got to gussy up and you got to make that the good old infotainment. That's right. Yeah. Breaking uh, down that, and, that boundary. Right. And I guess another portion of that is that, um, you know, the whole idea of it bleeds, it leads because we are as uh, humans, much more attuned to things that might have a detrimental effect. You know, right, it's right. something could hurt us or it's going to be, you know, bad for our family or our financial situation. We're much more attuned to that than like the good news. And so if you it's like, oh no, there's a uh, breaking news about like a standoff. They've been there for 16 hours, but it's breaking news. Yeah. It's still happening. Um, and, and it, it clicks on that same like little, you know, uh, limbic system in the lower part of the brain stem. That's like, oh, this is something dangerous and I need to pay attention to that. Yeah, that or desire, right? You can get people really tuned in if you suggest that they're going to get something for free or super cheap or that the people that they don't like are going to get hurt somehow, you know. So, I mean, one of the things we might want to do is kick around some of – there isn't like a standard definition of rhetoric. I mean, you can go to the dictionaries and they'll give you definitions, but they all vary from each other. And – um there are some good ones that are, you know, within the history of, of thought. So, you know, you mentioned um, Plato and the Gorgias. He he characterizes rhetoric in a very negative way. It's a persuasion of ignorant masses in public settings. He calls it a kind of flattery and he compares it to cookery as opposed to medicine. Now, you know, you can actually cook things healthy. Plato doesn't mean that, but that would be more like what he's calling medicine. Um, cookery is where you use salt and sugar and fat and make things, you know, really tasty and appealing, even though they're not good for you. I mean, it's, it's basically what a lot of the big food companies do these days with processed food. And and so he views rhetoric not as an actual art or science, but just as like a whole bunch of techniques that unscrupulous people use. Um, Aristotle, who's much more receptive to rhetoric having some sort of role, defines rhetoric in a, a kind of more boring way. You know, it's not quite as exciting. The faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion, you know. Um, if you unpack that, what does that mean? The rhetorician can like look at any given speech or communication situation and figure out how to appeal to their audience. You know, what, what does it take to get people to pay attention or, or listen? Um, Cicero calls rhetoric, um, speech designed to persuade kind of along the same lines, right? Uh, Quintilian calls it the art of speaking well. Um, one of the negative definitions that came up in the modern period, John Locke called rhetoric a powerful instrument of error and deceit, but he's committed to a different idea of, you know, philosophy and, and speech. Um, uh, I.E. Richards, the great, um, 
uh, critic said rhetoric is the study of misunderstandings and their remedies. I kind of like that one, you know, and it, you can, now you compare these against each other, right? Maybe we could say, well, they're all, and I don't want to appeal just to the old thing of the blind men and the elephant, but maybe there's something kind of like that, you know, where like one guy's touching the tail and he's like, oh, it's a rope. And another guy touches the, the, uh, uh, side of it, you know, it's a wall, right? So maybe these are are coming up with different important aspects of rhetoric. It could be used for bad. It could just be pushing people's buttons. Like you mentioned, the limbic system, right? A lot of rhetoric appeals to that. But maybe it's also something, you know, like if Aristotle and Cicero and Quintilian are right, maybe it's something that that if you want to be an effective communicator, you need. So if, if you are one of the good guys, you're communicating important messages. You, you have to figure out how to articulate that message so people can hear it. So you're saying that uh, only defense against a bad guy with rhetoric is a good guy with <laughs> That's actually quite good. I mean, that's, that's an example of, of using a metaphor and transforming it, right? That's rhetoric right there. Yeah. So we're doing kind of meta rhetoric in, <laughs> in, uh, making up those funny examples. I mean, what do you think about that? Oh, well, I, I want to go really back for just a moment. Yeah. To, um, we, when I asked, said like, is it good or bad early on? I said, it depends. Yeah. And so one of the things that depends here is uh, how you're defining things to be good or bad in the first place. And so um, when we're talking about uh, uh, Plato here talking to Socrates, that he's say, making the argument that uh, the only thing that is not has a tail or an end. Um, mm-hmm. that moves towards the good in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. And that anything else is like a knack or like a, a, an entertainment, like playing the flute or you know, cooking. So these are things that appeal to the senses, but they don't actually always lead to the good. Yeah, they're not um, good for us. Like cooking, cookery is going to make us fat and sick and, you know, stuff like that. Whereas medicine will um, give us a proper diet that will 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 conduce to health, right? And whereas, you know, uh, Aristotle, I think, starts off the rhetoric saying that, like, the rhetoric is the counterpart to dialectic. Right. Putting it way up higher well, on the same level as dialectic, whereas uh, Plato thinks that these things are totally different, that one is entering towards the good and the other one is not. Um, and, and it seems that he's making the argument of, like, our faculties here, and that like, yeah. these are things that we can improve about ourselves on uh, and that is something that you can be learned and taught. I mean there's I mean there's two things to say in response to that. One is that Plato himself is clearly a great rhetorician, you know, <laughs> because in in the dialogue Socrates, <laughs> you know, uses all sorts of rhetorical techniques without saying that he is and snookers his interlocutors and Plato himself is a master of composition, right? So there's that side where you're like, well, is he really that much against rhetoric or is he more against like other people using rhetoric? <laughs> well, the, the entire way that he sets up most of the, or the platonic dialogues is him speaking through the voice of Socrates. That's true, Which yeah. is everyone considers to be the best philosopher in the world anyways. And so you've already, you know, on <laughs> up the, the ethos here. It's yeah, like, oh, yeah. I'm not going to put these ideas in the, in the mouth of someone that already have a high reputation about and now he, whatever he says comes out with a stronger uh, force than just some guy that's true uh, yeah i mean plato himself supposedly was a poet before he abandons poetry for philosophy and it's because of socrates right so clearly he had some linguistic skills um and then he meets Socrates. He watches what he does. He's, he's learning new techniques from him and how he's, uh, handling these, these, these other people who are much more committed to just rhetoric. The other thing I was going to say about Aristotle though. So we know Aristotle's the student of, of Plato. So for, as you pointed out, for Aristotle to elevate rhetoric and say it's like a counterpart or literally anti-strophe to, to dialectic, um, makes it, 
an interesting departure from his his former teacher, right? He's he's um, definitely changing things up by by finding a role for rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, them being student, student teacher shows that it does not mean that uh, one's ideas would come only from their masters. Uh, but uh, anti-stroke, could you define that a bit? Oh, so it's like a counterpart is, is one way to think about it. I mean, it comes from from music, right? And from poetry. So like you say one line and then the next line is the antistrophe to that, you know? Um, and, and we should, we should also say what, when we mentioned this term dialectic, right? And that means a couple different things. So it's not, if, if you're into like Hegel or Marx or these later thinkers, what Plato and Aristotle meant by dialectic is not the same thing as what these later 19th century thinkers thought. Dialectic is a, um, it's also using language. You know, the lectane in it is, is speaking. And you do it by like kicking around ideas. Aristotle actually says that dialectic is what we have to use to figure out the basic principles and starting points for all the other disciplines and arts, you know. And it provides us with um, a way of, of getting through things and making sense of them. And, um, he, he thinks that, and you see this Aristotle doing this in his own works. He thinks that the, where you start from is not just like going off in your room by yourself and closing everything off and then doing pure abstraction. You see what other people had to say about something. Um, you know, famous people, people that you consider wise or smart, the ordinary people. And then you kind of sift through it and you say, how much of this is BS and how much of this is actually valuable? Um, and that's what Aristotle does in almost every one of his works. As a matter of fact, he does that in the rhetoric, too. He, he says, well, some people say this and some people say this. And I think that here's here's the the actual situation. Um, that's so that's what dialectic does. And dialectic is aimed at truth, whereas rhetoric is aimed at persuasion. Um, so they have different, you know, different goals. But I don't I don't see them as incompatible, you know. I suppose they use a lot of the same devices and right, to right. Get to the same ends. And yeah. So for to continue on what you're saying, it's like we uh, we have a really good uh, ability to uh, come up with ideas. Yeah, yeah. We have a right. really good idea ability to find holes in other people's ideas. Yep. But we're not so <laughs> great at finding the holes in our own ideas. Right, and that's one of the big things that dialectic allows us to do is we present an idea. You need to be in a place where you, you know, it's okay for you to uh, actually be, you know, talking and and get good feedback. That's not going to you know, someone whip you down, uh, but to get that feedback that is going to go, oh, okay, um, they point a hole out. I need to combine some mortar and patch up that hole here, yeah, yeah, or yeah, make yeah. my yeah. thing still work, or I need to throw this away and I need to. You know, start from something else. Yeah, and I think when you when you frame it like that, I think people can see that this isn't something that just philosophers do. This is something like across the board. Like you could be in a business meeting and trying to figure out like how do we how do we deal with this problem? We're, you know, we're having some issues that HR brought up in terms of hiring good people, right? And then, you know, the boss comes in and says, okay, we're brainstorming. No bad, no bad answers here, right? Obviously, that's not completely true because if you say something like, I think we should just, um, you know, uh, walk down the street and like throw money on the ground. Um, the boss is probably not going to be like, oh yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. They're going to say, come on, shut up and w- quit wasting our time. Who's got a better <laughs> answer than that? Right. Um, but you know, the, like you pointed out, the, the not having to fear somebody being just cheerily competitive with you and jockeying for position and saying, stuff to shoot your proposal down just because it's not their proposal. But, you know, people coming and, and giving, uh, what do we call it? Like, you know, um, positive feedback uh, in the sense of like useful feedback um, because they want you to do better. That's that's dialectic. Um, 
when we get a student paper and we cover it with red ink and we're like, this, this phrase should go here and this should go there. That's kind of like dialectic, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of like, what is it? You know, minds that you're going to go into this place and hopefully you also have people that will work with you to actually grow with you. That's the trick is finding the right people. Right. Um, and, and maybe you can use some rhetoric to convince people. Yeah, and and I, and my personal view, I, I, I kind of go with Aristotle and with somebody else. We're going to talk about Cicero, who think that um, you do need to like know what you're talking about. That's important. Um, you do need to like try to aim at the good, but you really do need rhetoric in order to be effective. Um, if and so let, let's talk about Cicero, right? And some of the other people. So um, Cicero has a book called the Stoic Paradoxes, and he begins the Stoic Paradoxes, which is about Stoicism. Um, and and paradoxes are things that you know, like, are counterintuitive. You could say we actually did a whole. Um, and we did we do two uh, episodes on paradoxes, or just one episode? Uh, I'm well mixed. Uh- one or two doesn't matter. Okay, so the Stoics had all sorts of things that they were saying that other people were like that sounds crazy, and these were really important to the Stoics. And Cicero said, "You know, you, you Stoics are not doing yourselves any favors by just like throwing these in people's faces and saying, there you go, study it, you know, learn it, and you gotta like." You got to massage it a bit. You got to like express it in a way that people can actually connect to. So like one of these paradoxes is all good things are equal to each other in their goodness. All bad things are equal to each other in their badness. Very counterintuitive, right? Because you can say if I have a 104 degree fever, that's a bad thing. That's worse than having a 99.9 degree fever. Um, and the Stoics are saying, no, no, they're, they're all equally bad insofar as they're bad. So Cicero begins that work by saying, you Stoics, you got great ideas, but you're really crap at expressing them. And I'm going to show you how to do it, you know, <laughs> what you ought to be doing. And, uh, you know, he's doing that in part because he thinks that good ideas do deserve a hearing. A- and we have to do that with rhetoric. There's no other way to effectively do that we can you know we can present things with just just the facts just the arguments and that doesn't usually convince anybody right so how how does a good person a wise person actually impart that wisdom right to other people in a way that they will actually take it up um, and if you fail on that then you're Failing at sharing that wisdom with others. Yeah, I mean, you're still going to have a few people who read your stuff and they're like, oh, this guy's amazing. Um, but you're not going to have any broad social impact, you could say. And right. people like Aristotle and people like Cicero really did have some massive social impact because of their their use of rhetoric. Um, Speaking of use of rhetoric and having massive impact, like if you look at any of the Greek city states that had Democracy. They had to go yeah, through and yeah. sit and talk and convince their fellow citizenry on whatever they had to do. Be it, you know, uh, design a new bathhouse or, you know, raise an army to go and uh, defeat an invader. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, from the mundane to the, the most important things that one is going to make a decision on. And you had to sit there and convince everyone to. Uh, Go with your plan. Or at least enough people to vote for you. Like you could get a majority, you know. Um, but you're right. Yeah. That, that is one reason why rhetoric became so massively important in ancient Greece. And similarly so in like Republican Rome, you know. Cicero himself was a politician, an orator, a lawyer. He's using rhetoric all of the time. Um, In the later Roman Empire, so like if we're talking about the time when Augustine is around as as a teacher of rhetoric, it's turned into something that's more like um, a component of how you teach young people how to how to communicate but a lot of the things that they were using rhetoric on were stock exercises like come up with a speech that um, 
uh, you could have used to seduce Helen of Troy, you know? That's not quite the same thing as like talking to your fellow citizens and convincing them that, yes, we do need to go to war with the Spartans, even though they're scary as hell, you know, (laughs) something like that. And and I think that, you know, um, we in, in our society, right, when we teach rhetoric, sometimes we do it in speech classes, sometimes we do it in ret comp. A lot of times the exercises are pretty artificial. We're not really teaching people how to use rhetoric effectively. Whereas, you know, who is? Well, you know, salesmanship, teaching people how to sell cars or candy right. bars or whatever else it happens to be. Um, another, you know, um, I mean, sales, car salespeople get a bad rap, and I think rightly so because some of the time they're lying to you about, you know, how great this car is going to be, right? Um, but we can think about other cases too. Like, so within the so-called, you know, manosphere, right? There's the pickup artists who are engaging in what they call game. That's all rhetoric, you know? So if you're using a technique like negging somebody, which I don't think works really my, myself, I, I can't imagine it really working, but maybe, maybe it does where you denigrate somebody to try to get them to be interested in you as a sexual partner. That's a bad use of rhetoric, right? Right. And, and people learn it and teach it and charge money for teaching it. Yeah, it's kind of just overall sad, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> um, then it, it, like, there might be a certain class of person that that little rhetoric trick might work. Yeah. Um, but um, also because it's become well known, it now becomes more people are kind of inoculated to it they know that's true on. yeah and so, so there's, there's a when you were talking about specifically about the um who's teaching rhetoric it's yeah, the sales people yeah. and if we're not teaching other people rhetoric then it makes them more easy to be susceptible to these rhetorical tricks that are used in everyday life i mean in other places marketing departments right or advertising or or things like that um and, you know, it's interesting, too, because when you talk with people in marketing, some of them are quite concerned about the ethical implications of what they're doing and teaching. So, you know, there's there's some that have boundaries, you could say. Um, something else I wanted to hit on, though, like in this history, before we talk about some of the techniques or some mm-hmm. of the ways of breaking it down. So in, in what we call the Enlightenment, you know, the early modern period to like the 19th century, there was this real tendency to say rhetoric is just a bad thing. And in ways that maybe even went beyond Plato. Like, you know, we, we mentioned John Locke earlier. Rhetoric is just sophistry and lies, you know. Um, Rene Descartes, who is also a great rhetorician, he, um, he's sort of like Plato. He's good at rhetoric, but he, he denounces it. He says, you know, I thought that eloquence is a gift of the mind. Um, people who have the most powerful reasoning and direct their thoughts best in order to make them clear can always convince us best of what they're proposing, even if they only speak the the language of Lower Brittany and have never learned rhetoric. Now, speaking the language of Lower Brittany in France would be saying, like, if somebody is the hillbilliest of the hillbillies and can barely speak, you know, the language of the land, um, if they're telling the truth, they're going to be convincing. Now, that is a pretty good piece of rhetoric on Descartes' part, because clearly that's not true. <laughs> but it sounds true, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, uh... I don't know if it sounds true to me, but it, like he, he's rather eloquent. I will do give him that. Yeah. So, you know, there's this tendency and I think there's still quite a bit of it today where people are like, yeah, if you're doing rhetoric, you must be a liar. You must be tricking people, you know, but in, in the 19th and then 20th century, and even going in, in, into our own time, we've had some just amazing contributions by people who are recuperating rhetoric and saying it has to be an important part of our life. And, and they haven't just been like going back to Aristotle and Cicero and Quintilian and saying we just like reduplicate what they're doing. They're adding new stuff as as time goes on. 
and this is why I wanted to bring up them in the first place. Is okay. That, like, this is not a a dead piece of like thing that you know was once important, but now really isn't. Yeah, or that it's, yeah. It's, it's languished, and people haven't actually done new work. There's lots of work going on this, and um, not only do we have like you know writing and speech making as rhetoric, but we have all these new mediums. Go to the whole way. You know, the medium is the message. As right. Now a, yeah, yeah. A basic form of rhetoric. You can look at um, all of our social media, even to like the newest stuff with like TikTok and what not really short form videos that are or memes are all uh, rhetoric in different ways of presenting the same thing of trying to convince people of an idea, the truth of an idea. Um, we can go into. Aristotle on that a little bit later. Well, you know, it's. I think that's a great jumping off point. Um, there is a tendency among some people to say, well, I just need to study Aristotle or I just need to study Cicero and then I'll know everything I need to know about rhetoric. And they don't remember that, you know, Aristotle's, you know, he's, he's in a different culture that was 2,300 years ago. And there's so much that he didn't anticipate. So he's got some cool ideas to give us that can be quite helpful, but not everything fits into the, let's say, the slots that he he lays out for us. We have to be um, willing to figure out, like, how does a meme actually work, you know? So, and I don't, th- I don't think that Aristotle is particularly helpful for memes, but he, he is helpful for lots of other stuff. I, don't know, I feel like it could probably shoehorn a little bit in there, but yeah, it's not a one. Okay. One. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I guess the uh, the truth um, or not is, is definitely one of the, um, uh, especially if we're talking about the legal. So if someone's guilty or not, and so there's uh, memes are really, really, especially like the the image macro memes are okay. really, really short form that has very um, simple idea that's put forward with it and um, i guess i need to bring in uh enthememes which are not actually related to memes but it's an argument right, right. um that is what aristotle calls the the center of rhetoric it is a um usually what would we call a uh, deductive argument with at least one of the premises missing so one of the uh most well-known arguments is on um, all men are of uh, mortal socrates was a man therefore socrates is mortal but uh anthony would be like well, yeah socrates is a man thus he's mortal like you don't have yeah. to we, we know the other one empirically or at least as long as we're in the same culture we have these same similar ideas yeah and yeah. so the uh, rhetoric is constantly using this thing where there's a number of bits of information that you assume your audience already knows and agrees with and then you can build off of that and make conclusions without having to go through the entire like build out every single step of <laughs> yeah. I mean, a deductive that gets, argument that gets pretty tedious right right yeah. um, so going back to a meme there's a lot of subtext that each one of these assumes that you know before you even get into the meme. And so there's like, you know, uh, and that's why some people don't get some of the memes, right? Because they don't, they don't have the missing bits of information. And, and that's, that's all politics. Like, especially if you have like certain, if you're on the right or the left, there, there are certain arguments that will resonate more for the right or the left because they're, of coming into it with certain preconceived ideas or notions of the world and how people react or interact with it. You know, for example, like one of my favorite ones to kind of diss on is the the just world fallacy. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. We, well, you have to explain which, what that is. Yeah. So the just world fallacy is that like, um, if you work hard and and follow the rules, you're going to get rewarded. Um, but the world isn't just, and you can do all the right things, and you can still have someone you know beat you down or yeah. destroy your house or or whatever. Um, just because you happen to be good and did all what was expected of you doesn't mean that everything is going to turn out well. Um, but if you have that understanding, the the expectation, then you can build arguments based off of this just world fallacy um, that will resonate with other people that hold the same idea. Yeah. You know, there's another aspect of the Entha meme that's really, I think, quite astute of Aristotle to observe, which is that 
People like these kinds of things, not just because they want you to cut to the chase. They don't want to be overwhelmed with too much information. But he says that they like figuring out the, the missing parts. And so there's a certain kind of curiosity or excitement or enjoyment that comes with hearing somebody give them. It's almost like part of the puzzle. And then they it's a simple puzzle. They have to figure out the rest of it. And so a really good rhetorician is, as Aristotle says, enthematic. He he's able to provide people with just enough to get them to where he wants them to go, because sometimes, you know, it is a matter of like stuff that we all know. And sometimes it's a matter of stuff that people, as they're engaging in their wishful thinking, would really love to be the truth. You know, mm -hmm. like if you think about advertising, right? If you buy this product, then, you know, and we show you a little vignette of like um, a guy buying the product. Let's say it's cologne or something. And then he's got, you know, uh, a beautiful woman who's clearly out of his league hanging on him. The implication is that there's a connection between between these things and they don't even have to spell it out they just like show you the picture of it and then you're like yeah i should go and get myself some uh, axe body spray or whatever it happens to be <laughs> i mean axe did this thing where they had these guys getting sprayed with it i don't know if you remember this advertising oh, yeah. campaign and then women would be chasing them beautiful women you know and the implication is well you can be like these lucky guys too you know um, and thus my high school was inundated with <laughs> axe body spray it was terrible and Ugh. and i I was teaching college at the time and yes it was the same problem you could smell it everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so like someone let off like a, a, a stink bomb but it was like just musty uh, well and, whatever and there were different uh varieties of it so they didn't all smell the same and you put them together and it's like a it's not a symphony it's like a a discord of stink you know yeah i, I wonder if this is how like um how 1600s france smelled like when everyone was just like constantly covered <laughs> well, with very large amounts of perfume because like because they stank so bad so now, exactly. you, now you got two different sides because at least the guys who are using axe hopefully are taking showers regularly whereas in, oh oh you sweet summer child <laughs> So they were they were essentially taking a perfume bath, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, think of a 13 year old boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this this uh, when you said like one of the things that makes people enjoy these arguments is enthymemes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is people finding it kind of like under sussing out what they're they're trying to imply, and this is um, I would argue a very similar reason to why we find things jokes humorous that they are these uh partial arguments with portions of them not uh described and either um you agree with it and you kind of like you laugh at the thing you're in, you're in on, the, on joke. the joke yeah yeah exactly you get it yeah. um or on um, the other way you do it is that you you create a, an enthemy a story that's leading you to one thing because you've s or subtracted oh, yeah, one of yeah. the the premises and then at the very end you add one more premise that totally turns what you were thinking that unknown premise was to a totally different premise and the uh, juxtaposition of these two things that you thought was true and now it's the other thing makes yeah. it funny yeah. And there are some, there's like a whole philosophy of humor out there. It's like a big field. And that is one aspect that some theorists talk about with jokes. It's got to have some sort of twist to it. So mm -hmm. some jokes only work like the first time that you hear them. And then you're, you're in on the joke and it's not, it's not as funny anymore. Whereas other jokes, you can hear it multiple times and that twist still works. Right. Yeah. But like one of my favorites is, um, uh, why did they say uh, signs in front of escalators? I'm sorry, escalators are broken. They should have a sign that says, uh, "Escalator temporarily stairs." You're welcome. <laughs> that is a good one. Yeah, and I've heard that joke like a, a hundred times, and I still find it hilarious. You know, it works too with visual things where we like, I don't know, especially with like animals, we expect to see them doing one thing and then suddenly they, they, they do a totally different thing. Sometimes it veers off not into funny, but into cute. Mm -hmm. Right. So there could be other modalities, I suppose, of it. 
Um, but coming back to the enthymeme, yeah, Aristotle thinks that this is really central to how rhetoric works, but it's it's one main mode of how rhetoric works. And I think we'll probably just have enough time to talk about these three modes of persuasion that Aristotle highlighted. So, you know, if you Google Aristotle rhetoric, one of the things that will probably come up is logos, ethos, pathos. These are Greek terms. And what we've been talking about with like the enthymeme, that's logos or argument, um, logical presentation of things. And, and you can convince people using that. You know, you, you can make an argument. But um, we also talked a little bit about um, keying into people's emotions. Well, that's pathos. So Aristotle says that, you know, people see the world and their situation differently depending on what they're feeling. So if you can actually make people angry and direct their anger at the things that you want, you can get them to do certain things. Um, if you instead want to make them fearful, then you have to know how to provoke fear, you know, or envy or emulation or love or hate or any of these other emotions. Now, some of them are more effective than others, you know. Um, just making people sad doesn't really motivate them to action quite as well, even if it's like that, those infamous um, uh, is it humane society stuff that had uh, Sarah McLaughlin and it would show like the horribly abused animals with a, you know, sappy Sarah McLaughlin sawing behind it um whenever that comes on my my wife actually turns it off because it, it tugs at her heartstrings mine too <laughs> but hers more than mine um sadness doesn't motivate people that well but desire fear anger all these things they sure do you know uh to go back to like body spray you can get people to buy deodorant if you suggest to them that nobody's gonna like them if they stink <laughs> that's that's fear right <laughs> so so that's another important aspect. And then we have what's called ethos, meaning character. And you mentioned that earlier, right, with, with mm -hmm. Socrates, Plato using Socrates as, as a mouthpiece. So, you know, what kind of person you present yourself as being, that is um, – that's that dimension of ethos. And, and Aristotle actually tells us, and he might be wrong about this, but I think this is a kind of a good guide uh, guideline that there's three important features. We want to see that people are actually good people. They're virtuous. We want to see that they have practical wisdom. They know what they're talking about. They, they understand how things work. And then he talks about goodwill, and he says that if you really want to be convincing, you have to get the audience to think that you aren't just a good person and have something to contribute, but that you care about them. You want the best for them. And if you don't have that, you're, you're not going to be as convincing. Right. Because if, if you just think that they're out for themselves and like, oh, yeah, do this because I'm going to make money. Then I'm like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, do, why should I care about that guy? I mean, it's interesting if you think about multi-level marketing. And I, I realize we're getting really close on time, so I'll keep this yeah. super, super short. You know, in multi-level marketing, you're making money on people who are below you in the organization. You have to convince them that it's a good thing for them to be paying out some of their money to you. And the way that you do that is by, like, having them at parties and saying, hey, we're all in this together and, you know, stuff that's clearly false. <laughs> Right. So, uh, PSA on um, multi-level marketing is a pyramid scheme. Don't do it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, I guess we leave you here today with the words of Aristotle. What makes a person a sophist is not his faculty, but their moral choice. 